la giornata di studi con la sessione pomeridiana, come avevo annunciato al mattino eh, i saluti istituzionali del Politecnico di Torino, del Rettore, saranno portati dal mio collega Enrico Macci, che è seduto qui alla mia sinistra, eh, il professor Enrico Macci, il Vice Rettore della Ricerca, e in realtà altre deleghe importanti come internazionalizzazione ed altro ancora, e, però ci tengo a sottolinearlo, è un collega ingegnere informatico, quindi il tema di oggi è vicino anche direttamente all'interno dei suoi interessi professionali e scientifici. Grazie molto di essere passato. Grazie Juan Carlos, grazie a tutti per l'invito. Il convegno è sicuramente di interesse centrale per alcune delle aree scientifiche del nostro Ateneo. Eh, in generale l'Information Technology eh, raccoglie circa... Boh, almeno il 20% delle attività che noi facciamo come numero di docenti, di ricercatori, di assegnisti, dottorandi. È una quota cospicua anche della contrattazione, quindi della ricerca applicata che noi facciamo, insiste sul settore dell'information technology, di cui l'informatica è parte, non dico predominante, non dovrei dirlo, ma è crescente diciamo, rispetto alle altre aree che sono l'elettronica e le telecomunicazioni. Eh, il tema dell'integrazione o della cross disciplinarità delle scienze umane delle scienze, eh, con le scienze fisiche, matematiche e tecnologiche sta diventando sempre più eh, d'attualità, lo vediamo in vari campi il tema dell'etica è ancora, ancora più trasversale e di questi giorni eh, lo vediamo basta aprire i giornali, il tema dell'etica è qualcosa che secondo me è molto importante tornare a rendere eh, come dire, un punto di riferimento soprattutto per i giovani che noi dobbiamo andare a formare. Nello specifico caso eh, del nostro settore tecnologico è chiaro che eh, ci sono tutta una serie di tematiche che vanno a intersecarsi con il tema dell'etica professionale, l'etica in senso ampio, sia per quel che riguarda il comportamento dei singoli e delle persone in un contesto come può essere quello universitario, sia in un contesto dove uno fa ricerca e quindi c'è la questione della proprietà intellettuale, della proprietà della ricerca che uno sviluppa, eh, sia eh, dal lato più diciamo, commerciale tutta una serie di tematiche e di problematiche che hanno a che fare con eh, poi come si può sfruttare l'invenzione, come si può sfruttare il risultato di una ricerca, come si può trasformare questa ricerca in business senza andare a eh, come dire, sovrapporsi o a entrare in conflitto di interesse o conflitto di, eh, di business, se vogliamo, eh, con altri attori che tipicamente partecipano a queste tipologie di ricerca e di attività. Io credo che il convegno che ha organizzato, organizzato Juan Carlos e che eh, in generale si inquadra in una di queste attività che il centro Nex sta portando avanti abbia quindi una rilevanza sia dal punto di vista della disseminazione sia appunto dell'approfondimento. Nexa è un centro del Dipartimento di Automatica e Informatica del Politecnico di Torino sta raggiungendo una grossissima popolarità, sta raggiungendo una reputazione che all'inizio forse non ci si aspettava neanche potesse crescere così rapidamente, è uno dei pochi centri in Europa che tratta questo tema della società e la tecnologia dell'informazione di cui internet è una delle espressioni più se vogliamo, visibili e quindi a noi fa sempre piacere ospitare questo genere di iniziative, da un lato perché appunto rendono eh, visibili problematiche che hanno a volte poca, eh, come dire, sono poco considerate all'interno di una realtà, un ateneo tecnologico come il Politecnico e dall'altro lato ci permettono di avere una visibilità a livello internazionale che in alcuni settori, proprio perché siamo persone tecnologiche, non abbiamo modo di eh, valicare o di, o di frequentare. Non voglio farvi perdere troppo tempo perché credo che le relazioni siano più importanti delle mie parole, ne approfitto soltanto per portare il saluto di tutto l'Ateneo, il rettore purtroppo oggi non è potuto essere presente ma mi ha delegato a portarvi questo saluto di benvenuto e di buon lavoro, ripeto le iniziative NEX sono sempre benvenute, sono sempre bene accolte, sono frequenti e ci permettono di ospitare per il Politecnico persone di altissimo livello quindi per noi questo è sempre un privilegio. Quindi grazie a Juan Carlos e grazie naturalmente a tutti quelli che sono intervenuti.
grazie molte al professor Macci, al vicerettore. E io passo direttamente alla presentazione del nostro terzo relatore per la terza lezione di oggi. Vi ricordo che il programma del pomeriggio è la lezione di, del professor Floridi, dopodiché una, di nuovo una pausa caffè e infine una tavola rotonda che si terrà in lingua italiana dove tenteremo di fare una sintesi e di capire quali sono i prossimi passi nel, per i temi che stiamo trattando oggi. Uh, presentare il professor Floridi è complicato, è, è complicato perché effettivamente è riuscito uh, nel, nel corso della sua carriera accademica a eh, unire una sequenza di eh, esperienze e di riconoscimenti veramente stellare. Io mi limito soltanto a fare eh, la diapositiva della sua situazione attuale, poi ha tra l'altro un sito web molto informativo che vi può raccontare di più di, di quello che ha fatto in passato. È professore in questo momento di filosofia etica dell'informazione all'Università di Oxford è Senior Research Fellow presso Oxford Internet Institute, che è un centro di quelli che, di cui ha parlato anche il professor Macci, che si occupa di internet in maniera interdisciplinare, lo fa ormai da più di 10 anni, quindi da alcuni anni prima della nascita del centro Next nel 2006, è Fellow in Special Election presso uno dei più prestigiosi college di Oxford, il St. Cross, all'interno della stessa università è inoltre Distinguished Research Fellow del Weiro Center for Practical Ethics, e siamo sempre qui a parlare appunto di ethics, ricercatore fellow in information policy del dipartimento di informatica, questo è un altro interessante esempio, eh, che io conosco solo pochissimi altri esempi di docenti che hanno questi multiple appointments in diverse school, Jonathan Zittra in Harvard che è professore di informatica, alla Kennedy School of Government e alla Law School e appunto Luciano Flori di Oxford, e professore a contratto del dipartimento di economia dell'American University a Washington, e le attività di ricerca riguardano prevalentemente la filosofia dell'informazione, di cui è uno dei conclamati pionieri e fondatori, la computer ethics e la filosofia della tecnologia. È autore di, eh, di molteplici pubblicazioni, in Italia è stato pubblicato la sua introduzione all'informazione da parte di Codice Edizioni, qua a Torino, cioè l'editore di Torino. Più recentemente eh, il suo nuovo saggio è The Fourth Revolution, How the Infosphere is Reshaping Human Reality, che sarà pubblicato a breve da Oxford University Press e aggiungo da oggi garante del centro Nex. A te la parola Luciano. Philosopher as an arm dealer. 
the worse things go, the more business. It just gets better and better. So if there's a revolution, if people aren't killing each other, if it is a mess, like ICT today, that's when the philosophers come in. They make good money. I think it's unfair towards philosophy. So let me remove from your initial impression that uh, philosophy is like uh, doing uh, nasty things with the wrong weapons. But I'd rather introduce three other analogies that I hope will explain to those of us who haven't been exposed to any philosophy or to the wrong philosophy, uh, um, perhaps the right framework. We need to talk about a gardener, a dentist, and a long jumper. So you understand uh, where philosophy is done, when it's done, and how it's done. So where? The gardener. You go to the garden, you enjoy the flowers, and you do not think about the roots. You think that as long as you enjoy and water the plant, the roots can take up themselves from them. If you do good gardening, the first thing you care is what is happening under the soil. The stuff you don't see, the real roots. Something goes wrong there, you screw it. So if you want to enjoy the flowers, the plants, mind the roots. And that's where philosophy is done. It's done under the visibility <coughs> of the usual people who walk around the garden enjoying the plants. So we, this afternoon, we're going to look at um, the deep root uh, garden. And since roots have a metaphorical value, here's the next uh, analogy, uh, the dentist. So if philosophy is done under the surface, when is it done? Well, normally it's done, like the dentist, at the very last moment when you just cannot hope to do anything else, and yes, you have to go to the dentist. Well, it's a good practice to do philosophy before it's too late. So the philosopher as a dentist will recommend you to go and check regularly your philosophy. Because one problem starts appearing, uh, it, might have, uh, it might require actually a radical solutions. So when try to do philosophy before it's too late? And how do we do philosophy at least uh, this afternoon? That's the long jumper analogy. Normally, especially if you're in Brussels, uh, unfortunately, I do spend quite a lot of time there, uh, you talk to some politicians and they point towards a particular problem. They say, well, we have this issue. What can philosophy do for us? Bracket, a sign of desperation. So, of course, uh, the dentist, you do that at the last moment. I say, time, what can we do for this particular problem? And uh, <coughs> that is the problem, then you start walking in that direction. And they say, no, 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 look, look, the, the problem is there. You shouldn't go, that's the opposite direction. Exactly. Because if the gap, if the problem is big, the last thing you want to do is to get close to the problem. You were never going to jump from here to there if you get as close as possible to the abyss. If it's really wide, well, then you step back. You pick up a very long run, and then you jump. So philosophy does the run-up, as it were, of any conceptual analysis. It goes exactly in the opposite direction you would expect, because it's looking for the roots at the right time, with the right so long uh, run. Now this is kind of philosophy we're going to do this afternoon. I hope this is clear, uh, because it's probably the last bit of clarity that you're going to get uh, today, and the rest uh, is going to be a bit hard. So, um, this is the uh, outline of the talk. Uh, I'll give you a quick introduction, uh, just to remind you a couple, a couple of things. This will be like a monopoly when you get a bit of cash to play with. It's a trick. You're supposed to lose of the cash. So I'll give you a little bit of understanding, but I'll take it away later. Uh, then uh, a framework. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce for you uh, the idea of politics in this new age, hyper-history. Um, in terms of um, Understanding what needs to be done, I'd like to then focus on norms, uh, rules of the game, and how this can be understood as specific agents in themselves, and what they mean in terms of uh, shaping our reality, and how do we design them, so the next topic. I will adopt justice and tolerance as the two principles to design norms which constitute agents that make a difference in our society. Society, agents, norms, design. Principles. I can do it left, right, right, left, but that's the idea. And you have to be able to keep up in mind this particular balls. So one, two, three, four, five. So you have the principles to design the norms, which act as agents in a society that has been modified by our cities. 
And finally, the real topic. There is a problem. There's not supposed to be that problem, so that's, that's, that's the wrong kind of uh, What is the problem here? That unfortunately in our society, justice and tolerance, which we use to design the norms for our society, have a difficult relationship with the amount of information that we are creating. What kind of difficult information? I'll tell you later, so you stay a little bit awake. <laughs> so, uh, the framework, the introduction. Uh, suppose we have Bob, no, nice, nice uh, smiling face. Bob is inside some place, any place, a room, a building, a hotel, his house, whatever. He's violently forced to move outside. Someone grabs him by the hair and says, oh, you have to go out. Now take Alice. Alice, she's outside. But someone decides that she has to move inside. She's violently forced to move inside. You've got the picture, is it? And then a bit of Greek. Otherwise it wouldn't be a philosophical lecture. So this is a violently forcing, the Greeks had a wonderful word for that, anankadri. Now that really means different things, but if you read 1, 2, and 3 uh, on the whiteboard, it's pretty much the same nasty stuff. Homer thought that it was force, constraints, necessity. Herodotus describes it as actual force of violence, torture. Sophocles describes it as bodily pain, anguish, distress, with a simple technical expression, a kick in the butt. That's what it is. That's what uh, anankalzoi ananket means. Why is that important? Because there are two great episodes in our Western civilization where ananket has been wrongly understood. We thought that these two people meant well, but it was ananke anyway. First episode, Plato. This is a famous citation, and if you have done any philosophy when you were in a particular high school, you might have encountered the metaphor. Compel them. And that's the Greek word there, it's important to remember. Anankadoiko. To stand up suddenly and turn his head around and walk and to lift up his eyes to the light. And in doing all this, felt pain. And because of the dazzle and glitter of the light, was unable to discern the objects whose shadows he formerly saw. This is the slave or the human being coming out of the cave. It's a painful, forceful, violent process. Someone is forcing Alice from inside to get outside. It's not nice. It's a clear sign of intolerance. Uh, surprisingly, the same word happens to be used uh, years later. Uh, this is also very famous, and uh, you haven't heard this. You didn't do uh, your Sunday Mass. And then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them. And a chasm, same word, to come in so that my house will be full. Luke 1423. It's the same violence. Now, um, the two writers were speaking for their masters. Luke was speaking for Jesus, and of course, Plato was speaking for Socrates. Neither of them meant to be nice towards either Alice. <coughs> Alice was forced to get out, Bob was forced to get in. The forceful nature of that is remarkable. And it's the foundation of the intolerance because we know better. Now that is a dangerous path to take. I'll come back to that in a few slides. So one more item you have to keep up in your mind. Change chapter completely. So don't forget, that's the cash I gave you. I'm going to take it back in a, in a few slides, OK? That's the model. So um, suppose we uh, take a, a, a quick hint. So, uh, one hour of course in what history is, and what you're told by the textbook is that history is everything that has happened to human life on this planet since we invented some way of recording the past. That's what history <coughs> means. Prehistory happens before the discovery, invention, the availability of recording things. So normally that means writing, but it could be anything else. So prehistory is actually no ICT whatsoever of any kind. Then we moved about 6,000 years ago into history. Now, history is when individual and social well-being are connected with that city. You don't have a Roman Empire or a British Empire without a way of recording and transmitting information. It just doesn't work that way. So, society starts, as it were, being strictly connected with the adding value of ICPs. And at some point, and that's where some people unfortunately mistake the information revolution for good America, for goodness sake. 
books don't, don't write themselves, computers do. So once you put together recording, transmitting, and processing all the data, then you have a society that ends up abiding sitting on top of ICT. It is dependent on ICT for its well-being, its welfare, its future, its added value, whatever is going to be making a difference. And if you think that this is, again, too much philosophy, well, uh, in a couple of days I'm going to be at the NATO meeting on uh, ethics and cyber war in Rome, and we're going to discuss exactly what happens to high-paid historical societies which are so dependent on ICT as to be vulnerable to cyber attacks. You see the picture? You cannot have a cyber attack against the British Empire with all this, because it didn't depend on ICTs so heavily. But you can put that this country on its knees today with a cyber attack, because we live in Italy in a highly historical society. So that's the picture. So what? I mean, what's next? Well, what comes next is that then we have a way of interpreting the state. Because the state uh, is, um, I think, France, Richelieu, three musketeers kind of state. Well, the state is the information agent. It try, tries to control, gets old, maneuver around education, census, taxes, police records, legislation, press, intelligence, and if there's anything else you want to add to that list, that's fine. Because that's the state in modernity. Is what uh, not this, the Leviathan by Hobbes is trying to put its uh, poems on. So you can read history, and this is really simplifying, but look into this. You can read history at the age of the state, and the state as the information agent. In hyper history, we start having different agents. Other agents start popping up. We can call them multi agent systems. Uh, I'll tell you more in a moment. But these multi agent systems are parallel to or work together with the state. It could be the European Union, or it could be Syntagma Square. But these are different agents that are now competing for the same kind of role at the historical level. So what? What then? What we know as the Westphalian order, 1648, uh, that's 20 years later. All the three musketeers, they were done all their business, now the, the government has changed, and in 1648 they meet again. That's the kind of Westphalian state we had in mind. So the Westphalian uh, order, end of the 30 years war, the eight wars, basically World War Zero. We end that, and we realize we have to get together. Something has to go, something has to be implemented. There's a new system of political order in Europe, sovereign states, which have this physical and legal space overlapping. They're governed by sovereigns, they control with physical force, they hold us. We knew what we were talking about. And we, now seeing from 1648 until recently, we actually thought we knew at least the game we were playing. Chessboard was there, the pieces were called national states. Now, we have moved, and I'm not the only one saying this, to a known or a post westphalian order. We're not quite sure where we are, but we know that these states are not working as the only agents on the chess board. Not least because if you think about the global environment, for example, you know that no single state can actually solve the problem. It takes many more to do that particular task. So uncertainty about multi systems, interactions and conflicts are, are blooming. It's a much wider phenomenon. We are empowering non-state organizations, corporations, NGOs, in economic and social control politics, occupy movement. You get a picture because it's in the newspapers on a daily basis. So what happens is that states become information societies. They, as information societies, empower a variety of new multi-agent systems, which then change the state itself from a centralized government into distributed governments. Basically, the states, in a sort of a self defeating modality, creates ICTs which then undermine its power by generating new multi agents. So there is no end of history, for those of you where the reference is going, but actually hyper history. To go from modern politics is based on the southern states, fine, and human rights, fine. But they are insufficient. Something else has to be placed. We're discussing this as we speak today. And um, the problem, therefore, and I hope this slide comes now at the right moment, if I started with this, it would have been utterly incomprehensible. In high history, you know what I'm talking about, the political problem becomes how do we design the right multi agent systems that can solve the global problems we have, for which the single end states are not wrong, just insufficient. We just don't have the right tone on the chessboard. That's where norms as agents kick in. 
because now we know that we need to design the engine systems. How do we do that? Well, we create them through a normal system. And that's what jurisprudence is largely about. It's not just about judging and punishing, but it's about creating a society in a particular sense. So again, what we have are a view of what the engine systems as constituted by rules or norms, which leads to the next question. How can we design the right norms then? Which then generate the right agents? Which then need to, you get a picture. I told you it was on no, five steps. So now we have at least move enough, remember stepping back so that we can finally launch forward. We need to move even further back, just one more step. Because if you need to design the norms that give rise to the agents, that can actually tackle the global problems in a post westphalian hyper-historical context, how do we design the norms? That's typical philosophy. Right? You never let go of that bone called a problem, a terrible problem. Norms are teleological agents, or agents with a purpose. They are there in order to achieve something. They are goal-oriented. They have a structure, they're designed, etc., etc. But finally, ultimately, you design norms with a purpose. They're there answering at what the heck for. And that's where we finally get close, sniffing the problem that we need to solve. Historically, we'll give me about the, the three, it's actually four. So we have identified basically four purposes of a system of norms as agents leading to blah, blah, blah. A peaceful society, that's why we want to have the kind of norms we have. Tolerant society, remember the start, Plato and Luke. A just society, as in fair society and a free society. These are the elements. Imagine a kitchen, that's your table, those are the ingredients with which you make that particular pizza called norms, which then delivers that particular so, dinner called etc. society. So these are the ingredients with which we have been playing for the past four or five hundred years, Westphalian afterwards. Of course we can't keep all this in mind, so we simplify. Now that we have reached finding the point, the three steps back have been taken, uh, let's take things away, let's abstract a little bit. Tolerance is going to be T, and peace P, and liberty L, and justice J. Those are the four things that we would like to see a society implement. What's the relationship here? Well, who comes first? Who generates what? Can I get something by buying one, get two? Well, look, a beautiful text saying, if you want to have a peaceful society, you need a tolerant society. Tolerance, I'm always simplifying, especially for the students, don't get it wrong. It's way more complicated, but not so, not so bad. So Locke will argue that if you want to have a peaceful society, tolerance is the means to deliver it. Get a tolerant society first, peaceful will follow. You pay one, tolerance you get two. Mill, much, much later, will say, well, wait a moment. If you have tolerance, you get liberty. So you pay one, you get three. You pay for tolerance and you get peacefulness and liberty. Can we get tolerance somewhere? At a different time, so this is a, it's a logical order, not a chronological order. Let's do that, please. You start thinking, if I just had a way of designing the norms, going to these principles, so that rule all the rest, and I can just invest on only one single foundation for my society, is it going to be tolerance? Well, that was the Westphalian project. We were working around the three musketeers, getting together 20 years later, on a tolerant society, thinking that's it, that's what delivers the kind of human project worth investing in. And then someone came and said, well, you can put these two things together. Now, if you add together the consequences of the same antecedent, to be a bit more logical, and if you get tolerance, you get liberty and uh, peacefulness. But there's one major way of getting tolerance, and that is justice. Get justice, that delivers tolerance, which delivers liberty, which delivers peace. Bingo. You pay one, you get four. And that was the Kantian move. And we've been with Kant ever since. Political theory in Western societies is not just based on, is lying on, is relying on, has only one foundation justice, because a just society will then have all the rest as a free, so uh, right. 
Could you extend that? If you have a Kantian philosopher, Rawls, Harvard, he will argue actually precisely the same. He will tell you, well, this is so true that in fact if you do not have tolerance, you don't have justice. Which is just another way of saying the same point uh, for the logicians among us. No, contraposition through only theory of implication. So if you compare the two by negating both, you get the same result. So we're not so far away. After all, Rawls is what you know, is justifying precisely the point. From uh, the Westphalian system all the way to last day research at Harvard on political theory, justice is the foundation. So that's, again, you cannot start the lecture with that particular line, but that should now tell volumes. Justice delivers tolerance, and together they deliver liberty and peace. You have now learned the sort of step back, more problems. You start immediately thinking, uh, what is the relationship between tolerance and justice? Are they on the same level, or one has in rules who come, comes first? Does one deliver the other, or are both necessary in order to deliver liberty and peacefulness? Can tolerance be delivered in the first place? This is called the paradox of tolerance, and you have great thinkers, uh, Popper, Rawls, dealing with that paradox, not a topic for today. And when Jay, justice, seems to deliver uh, tolerance, is it because actually we are confusing the two? We're not really making a difference between justice as fairness and policy, it's just the same kind of soup. So obviously one delivers the other. It's the same coin, just two sides. One is called justice, the other one is called tolerance. But if you give me that coin, of course you give me both sides at the same time. How then how do we unpack that particular delivery? And what can justice deliver in and of itself by itself? So in the rest of the talk, I'll focus only on two points. The first one, what is the relationship between uh, tolerance and justice? And the last one, what can justice deliver by itself? Would you pause for a moment uh, and consider what do we mean by justice and what do we mean by tolerance if all this mechanism is going to go anywhere? Surely you cannot give me the <coughs> department, it can mean so many different things. Now, the standard way of understanding uh, tolerance is the following. Um, I will give you just a moment to uh, look at the text. It is not important to either read the text or understand it. What is important is to see the pattern. A few bits are red and a few bits are black. And all that matters is that particular pattern. Because I'm going to show you another uh, pattern where all the bits in red tolerance are replaced by bits in red, justice. And that is rules 1999, a theory of justice, pages 3 to 4. The same text which tells you what justice is, works perfectly fine by replacing justice with tolerance. Surely, Mr. Rawls will play a little bit of a game here. Surely these are two sides of the same coin. That's why you can replace without knowing the difference in the same text, whether you're talking about justice as fairness or tolerance. So we are really talking about pretty much the same side of the equation. Get this to justice as fairness, more of this in a moment, or tolerance as more in a moment, and the rest will follow. How do we deliver the contemporary concept of justice as fairness, which is basically theorized by Rawls, but not just by him. It's a beautiful text, uh, again by Rawls, where Rawls um, suggests that the important thing about justice is that you are kept in the dark. It's called the veil of ignorance. But let me give you the, the citation as well. The citation is at the bottom. This is Rawls speaking on page 118 of A Theory of Justice. No one knows his place in society, his class position or social status, nor does he know his fortune in the distribution of natural assets and abilities, his intelligence and strength and the like. Because you're completely in the dark about where you're going to end up, then your decisions will be fair, because you're not going to risk it. You could be on the right or the wrong side, and you know what? Better go 50-50, just in case I'm going to end up on the wrong side of the divide. 
So a way, and that's the text above, of delivering justice as fairness is to make sure that there's a veil of ignorance. Principles of justice for the basic structure of society are to be chosen by representative parties deprived of information about the talents, abilities, socioeconomic status of the parties they represent. In other words, any politician who promises that you will be better off tomorrow, it's a problem. Because it's taking away the veil of ignorance, and if you are a rational agent, you will go for that politician, because he promised to you that you will be better off. You'll be an idiot if you didn't. Especially if he's promising a million jobs. So in this particular case, you need to be careful about removing information for justice to flourish. But we saw that justice and as fairness was a bit like tolerance. Final analysis, you mix up the ingredients, add a bit of salt, and the more justice and tolerance flourish, well, the less information sometimes has to be provided. You have to be hiding behind a veil of ignorance. Uh, the veil of ignorance is misnamed. Uh, what Rawls should have been really speaking in terms of information theory is uncertainty, as I shall show you in a moment. So this is far as tolerance, sorry, justice is concerned. Let me tell you a little bit more about tolerance and then we're back to the problem. Tolerance. How can tolerance be a matter of information? Well, this is what tolerance means. You need four conditions to be tolerant. One, you need to know about, say, Alice's actions. If you don't know, you're not tolerant, you still know. So you need to know, for example, that Alice is homosexual. You need to disapprove of that. You can't go like, yeah, I don't like it. I don't like you to be homosexual, sorry. And you cannot be powerless. You need to be powerful enough to be able to stop Alice. Otherwise, that's not tolerance. You're just putting up with it. I should. I wish I could do something about it. So, if you've got these three and four, you do not stop Alice, then you're tolerant. Because you know, because you don't like, because you could make a difference, and you don't do anything about it. You allow her to have whatever matters she likes in that society. That is tolerance. Now, for this tolerance, of course, to work, the part in bold has to be carefully measured. The more you know about Alice, of course, the tougher the pressure on the other three points. Imagine number one being zero, zero knowledge, zero information. Ah, that's, that's the most tolerant society in the world. Nobody knows anything about it. Fine. Anyone does whatever he or she likes. So here is the paradox that I was trying to show you a moment ago. I call it the political paradox of information, if you like, or anything you prefer. Justice is action without information. I'm always simplifying, but you get a picture. The better ignorance, the less you know, you don't know what you're going to end up with. Therefore, if you don't have that particular information and take action as in deciding how the society should go, the better the justice is going to grow. Tolerance is information without action. You have information, but you're not going to act on that particular piece of information. So what's the problem? The problem is that Rawls was right and wrong. He was right in saying that justice flourishes in a state of ignorance. He was wrong in thinking that there was any way possible in an information society. It's called an information society, for goodness sake. So clearly, that is not going to work, because you're giving me a, a recipe for a disaster. You're telling me that justice is going to grow as long as we take a certain amount of information away from society. In a world where information is constantly growing, this is where uncertainty has a great value. Because if you increase information, well, that does not necessarily increase and it's likely to decrease justice and tolerance. So what is the value of uncertainty? See, more steps back. I hope you're not getting tired, but we will run forward at a certain point. You see that now our little equation, I just simplified a few symbols, stupid things. Now you have the U for uncertainty delivering justice, which delivers, etc. So what is uncertainty? Don't get tired, we're almost there. Stay with me. <laughs> Can uncertainty be delivered in a world that is awash with information? Uncertainty as in not having information. And if uncertainty cannot be delivered, well then, are we screwed? Is, is that it? I mean, more strange politicians promising this and more and anything else for the future and us voting as rational agents and therefore not paying later. We never learn the lesson. 
in order to understand where we are and what needs to be done, uh, a moment uh, of relaxation, let me introduce a little game as a sort of video game. Imagine Alice is lost in the wilderness. Uh, for those of you who want to play that game, you know that that is the weird Alice, the one who got crazy after that, doing all the things in Oxford, and now he's going around killing people with a big knife. Uh, it's rather disgusting for those of you who haven't seen it. But that's aside. We need to understand her state of information. And there are four things that you need to keep in mind more. One, there are things that Alice knows. For example, there is a monster hiding somewhere. And she's afraid. So she knows there's a monster there. That is her information. I'm basically forcing you to make a 10 minutes you know, quick course on chapter one of information theory. Two, there are things that she knows she does not know. That's a so-called incipient technical term. Where the heck is the monster? There is a monster, I just don't know where it is. And I know that. I know that I don't know. So that's my incipient. I know that question, but I don't have the answer. And I don't have the question, I'm looking for the monster to kill. Then there are things that she is not even quite sure she knows at all. Uh, not her uncertainty. I have a weapon, I have this big knife kitchen knife, and is this sufficient to kill the monster? That I don't know. And finally, there are things that only we outside the game can tell about her. There are things that she doesn't even know she's missing. For example, she doesn't know that there is a magic sword that can kill the monster. And that is technically speaking uh, ignorance. That's why Rawls is wrong in calling the veil of ignorance the veil of ignorance. It's actually the veil of uncertainty. Because we know that we're going to end up somewhere having to make decisions about the political state. We just don't know where. So it's uncertainty. And for the sake of simplicity, for once, let's put together in sequence and uncertainty. There's a whole technicality that shows you that you can do that. So we reduce everything to information you have, information you know quite sure you have, information you're not even aware you're missing. And because looking at things is much easier, here is how we organize the pattern for Alice position. I'm getting close to the solution, man. Don't give up. Well, available information. Think of the game. All the things that are possibly knowable about the game. Two, what Alice has as an information. She has access to the questions. Is there a monster? And the answer, yes. Three, her uncertainty. She has access to the question, where is the monster? But no access to the answer. If the question stays there, up in the air. And four, this is Alice's ignorance. We can describe it for her, but she cannot have it. Because these are the questions she doesn't even have. So, to summarize, she has nothing, not even the question. She has the question, but no answers. Or she has the questions and the answers. So she has ignorance. Uncertainty or information. And that is the available information that Alice has in her hands. Make that a little bit of a, of a picture. And how do we therefore remember? We want to understand <coughs> how uncertainty deliver justice, etc. Now we had that little question. So, how do we generate that uncertainty? What is Alice's uncertainty? Well, it's all the available information to her. Then you subtract her ignorance, you subtract her information and you're left with the uncertainty. If you look at the square, it's much easier. You take the whole square, you take the other blocks, that's what remains. Or you can say, no, for Alice, it's uncertainty. It's all the information available minus the information accessible. Now, normally, this is the situation in which we live. We keep the available information stable, the uh, position of Alice in terms of ignorance stable. Remember, the information society is increasing her information. But that side of the square is growing and growing and growing. So that doesn't take an engineer to work out. The uncertainty is decreasing and decreasing. This is the picture that we have. Therefore, if her uncertainty is decreasing, so is the ability of uncertainty to deliver justice to deliver to the to the to the So the problem now should be Obvious. That's what we say. 
A global decrease in uncertainty leads to a global decrease in tolerance, put simply, more information, more intolerance. Is that true? Factually true? As in, it's all this uh, conceptual construction, nice talk, but the world is out there, so different. No, it is true. It's actually true as in a matter of fact, uh, painfully true. This is from the Pew Research Center's Forum on Religion and Public Life. Uh, they run this uh, global analysis of uh, tolerance and religion every X years. And uh, the last report uh, shows that there's more restrictions on religion between 2009 and 2010 in each of the five major regions in the world, uh, including, unfortunately, Americas, um, where, in fact, uh, tolerance has been uh, uh, declining, uh, sorry, increasing as a restriction declining. Now, this is something that uh, works much better on the web, so I uh, took four snapshots. I showed them to you twice, so I'll, I'll go forward and back. But this is the first snapshot, and you don't even have to read the names of the countries, but you can see that the more intense the color and the further top right that country is, size of the bubble is the size of the population, the more intolerant that the country is. On the two axes of state intolerance, and social intolerance. People don't like each other, and the state doesn't like you anyway. So that is in the past, uh, 2007, 8, 9, 10. Got the picture? Everything is bubbling up to the right. Not nice. It means that everybody is getting a little more intolerant at the state than the social level. Do it again. 2007, 8, 9, 10. On average, we have all moved top right. In a world that is increasingly more informed about anything and everything, or what you do this morning, and the newspaper we mentioned, uh, the coffee you didn't take, the shoes that you really like, Google and everything else, you should be doing better. No, that's the opposite. Of course, the more you know your neighbor, the less you like him. That's, that's the way it looks, to put it simply. So, more information, less tolerance, but tolerance was just the other side of justice anyway. So, justice is also suffering here. What we would like is the right hand side of the picture. Available information going up, yes, we like it. And ignorance going down, and information going down, and Alice uncertainty going up. Because if we guarantee her uncertainty, all the rest will follow, like a dominant effect. And uh, how do we do this? How do we, for example, improve Alice's uh, information, as in decreasing it? Remember, that's what Alice knows about the network. Concrete example, because I know that by now it's not thinking that's a form of philosophy. Here's one more. This was the policy that basically had been adopted when the US was Alice. And it was called Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Just, they, I just, I, I'm not going to say it. Don't tell me. <laughs> so the idea is that if Don't Ask, Don't Tell was the official United States policy of gay serving in the military between 1994 and 2011. This is exactly what I've been telling you so far. You try to decrease Alice information the army doesn't know so that tolerance increases. How? Because of that little scheme that, as I said, doesn't require an engineer to calculate. So you see that we're not getting far from the real world, religious intolerance of what the army does in the US. The conceptual analysis or engineering maps the facts on the other side. And how do you change the maps? Well, you try to reconceptualize, re-engineer your concept so that you can implement different rules. But this is not working. Uh, as I said, it was taken away because in 2011, the army said, oh, this is not right. Why? Well, because that sort of long list of symbols is fragile. And one of the things that you cannot allow is to increase U and J and J and T and then, oops, decrease liberty. Oh, that's a work. Sorry, this is not the right recipe. Oh, but I like more sugar. Yeah, but you can't get more salt either. Time. The, the two things just don't, don't match. So in this particular case, the analysis shows that you do not get what you want unless you keep all the variables in line. And the peacefulness and the liberty and the, and, 
and, and, and all the way down to uh, uncertainty. So it was actually changed, as you know. So that didn't work. Uh, what about available information? Can we actually uh, stop that? Well, that would be a joke. I was like, I'm part the world. The hell, let's, let's, let's get no more information produced so that the uncertainty will increase. Available rate of information must be assumed to grow with better in relation to the partition. Imagine that little scheme on bottom right, and then so just growing and growing and growing. It's boundless in its growth, but the very fact that it's growing, it doesn't change the ratios inside. Every square gets bigger anyway. More available information? Yes, more uncertainty, but more information available to others. More ignorance. So the problem doesn't change, just the size of the problem changes. We need to find a different solution. But you see, we're left with very few alternatives. The alternative is ignorance. We need to increase ignorance. Now that, I know that it's coming too. Yeah, you don't start at all by not saying, go for ignorance, exacerbating. But it's a specific kind of ignorance. It's not any ignorance. And I hope that the analysis so far has explained to you that it doesn't mean, okay, so Prof, no, went yesterday and said, lots of ignorance, I'm totally ignorant, thank you. Lots of... No, that's not the point. The point is, again, back to the game, a bit more subtle. Remember Alice alone in the forest? Ignorance. Now there's also Bob and his ignorance. What if we put the two ignorances together? What happens? All the things that Bob never even knew he was missing. And all the things that Alice didn't even know she was missing. Well, all of a sudden, it's very difficult for two sets of ignorances to overlap. What's going to happen if you put them together, and that's not part one for you, well, you have a certain amount of left ignorance in the middle, but there's a lot of shared ignorance, which is fantastic. And what is the shared ignorance? Uncertainty. <laughs> Let me do this again. Ignorance. You don't have even the quest, let alone the answer. If I share my ignorance with your ignorance, what will we end up with? Not information, but we now have. A lot of questions that we share. I have your questions, and you have my questions. And what are questions with our answers? Uncertainty. So we have increased uncertainty. Having increased uncertainty, bingo. This long line of things that we wanted to deliver is there. So I put that dash before the I in order to indicate uncertainty. If we increase uncertainty, as in put people together on the same line, let them ask questions to each other, let them share all the questions, they will be a little bit more skeptical. Nobody, as a skeptic, has ever killed anybody else, because it doesn't know, it cannot, it can't be sure. It's still wondering. So, push humanity on the same side more and more, and that's why global education is fundamental, and we will be sharing more and more ignorance, meaning we'll have a lot of new questions for which we have no answers. Answers to increase, and the rest may take care of itself. So justice and tolerance can be fostered by increasing uncertainty, which can be increased by increasing ignorance. Back to the original point, because I've taken it out of your uh, brain power for today. Remember we had prehistory, history, hyperhistory, we decided, well, in hyperhistory we need new agents. The state is not enough. How do you design the agent? Norms. How do you design norms? Principles. What principles? Justice and tolerance. What kind of justice? Fairness. What kind of tolerance? The other side of fairness. What tolerance means? Those four points. What do they have in common? Justice and tolerance. Information. In what way? In the restoration. The more information, the more difficult it is to implement it. justice and tolerance. How do we square this particular triangle, if you pass in the joke? Well, we need to be able to increase justice and tolerance while living in a world that is increasing information anyway. How do we do that? We need an analysis. What kind of analysis? We need to understand ignorance, uncertainty, and um, the, the stuff that she does have, but not quite. And how do we do that? Well, since information is increasing and uncertainty has to be increased, the only way of increasing human uncertainty is by transforming ignorance into uncertainty. And how do we do that? By sharing each other's ignorance. By sharing ignorance, we're sharing questions. By sharing questions, we don't have the answers. We increase uncertainty, and all the rest nicely follows, hopefully, at least on a philosophical textbook. So we're back to the original point. Wasn't this meant to do some work at a more general level? Well, 
We started by saying, oh, I started, right? History. The Three Musketeers. Um, the Count of Monte Cristo. Well, that's the age of the state. But it's also the age in terms of epistemology, of our approach to what knowledge is and or should be. The age of certainty and information as total values. You do not find anybody saying, oh, information moves and no, no, the more the better. Well, not quite. You need to be careful. It's like eating these days. There's good and bad cholesterol. There's good and bad information. There's good eating and bad eating. And we should stop overeating as we have, because we do come from millennia of starving, of starvation. But now we need to be careful since we have this stuff. So history becomes the age of certainty and information as values. A hyper history becomes the age of uncertainty and shared ignorance as values. And I find that remarkably satisfactory, at least from a logical point of view. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you to, for professor, to Professor Floridi for his uh, um, exciting presentation. Now we have uh, 10 minutes for um, conversation, questions and answers with uh, Professor Floridi. We have a microphone somewhere in the back, so if you want to pose a question, raise your hand. There's a question here, on the right. Giuseppe, over here. My name is Ricardo Lala. I, I uh, would ask you something to Professor, uh, exactly on the last uh, sentences. He said, miss uh, the relationship between uncertainty and uh, super history. Uh, a part of that, I, I find that this idea of uncertainty is typical of Eastern philosophy. In Japanese philosophy, there is aware, which is exactly this sense of indefiniteness, and it is very interesting. But uh, one thing which I do not understand very well, or I'm not so much persuaded, is that this idea of uh, uncertainty as intolerance in itself, that means in philosophy or in politics, is very good. But if you take into account that, on the contrary, the post, the, the super history is the moment in which technique dominates our destinies. At a, at a certain point that uh, normally we do not realize, let's imagine, for instance, uh, nuclear war. That means the lead time for nuclear war is half an hour. That means in half an hour, a, a nuclear war is finished, according to the present technique. So it is impossible that any man, not even the, the President of the United States, can decide uh, uh, this thing. So just machines already now decide our destiny. So there is not the risk that an excess of tolerance generates a weakness of philosophy and the politics towards technique. Allora, per una... Juan Carlos mi ha autorizzato a rispondere in italiano, no? spero che il collega non si offenda, uh, ho capito che deve essere rimasto disgustato dalla mia relazione in inglese, ha detto meglio che parla in questo Of course, of, course, of course not at all, il vero motivo è che non vedo più i nostri ospiti stranieri per cui mi permetto di, visto che so che Declan Brady doveva partire in anticipo, quindi Declan Brady non è ancora lì, però sta guardando la posta, non mi sta sentendo, e quindi eh, io passerei l'italiano anche per coinvolgere se possibile di più ragazzi che sanno perfettamente l'inglese, ma scommetto apprezzano anche il passaggio all'italiano. Facciamo un po' 50-50, insomma, mi sembra giusto. E la, la preoccupazione che, che lei ha espresso nella seconda parte del, del, del tuo intervento è assolutamente condivisibile. Io, mi dispiacerebbe molto se l'analisi che vi ho presentato dovesse risultare appunto nell'uscita da questa stanza dicendo ah, speriamo di essere tutti molto più incerti perché il mondo sarebbe più bello. No, ovviamente no, ci, ci mancherebbe. Ci sono moltissime cose e qui gli ingegneri ci, ci insegnano lezioni di go go, sulle quali è meglio sapere esattamente con precisione come andranno a finire le cose, anzi se volete i mercati e tutto il resto. Cioè c'è tutta un'enorme letteratura che di, ho messo l'italiano adesso io poi ti piasco nell'inglese, certe parole non le conosco, di risk adverse analysis, 
dove ovviamente il rischio è controbilanciato dalla certezza, cioè noi operiamo contro il rischio acquisendo informazione come se fosse a mo' di assicurazione contro il rischio. Tanta più informazione abbiamo, tanto più siamo in grado a volte, si spera, di poter gestire il rischio. Ora la mia analisi non era quindi un'analisi di tipo globale, in assoluto, in tutti i casi, in tutti i modi, indipendentemente, per un tecnicismo, per i filosofi, per noi, indipendentemente dal livello di astrazione, l'incertezza è sempre buona. Vi ho appena detto che usciamo da un periodo in cui la certezza era sempre buona e che facciamo? Perdiamo dalla padella alla brancia, allora, eh, avendo detto che il nero non andava bene, adesso tutto bianco, no? bisogna essere più intelligenti. Allora, lasciando stare gli sfumatori di grigio che non vanno più di questi tempi, la percezione di avere insomma, la possibilità di mediare in alcuni contesti in maniera più intelligente la montata di informazioni disponibili in modo tale che non si cada nella fallacia di pensare che più informazione tanto meglio ecco questo è il messaggio un po' oversimplificato di quello che volevo dire sulla prima osservazione che lei ha fatto a me se diventasse voce un po' più giapponese non mi dispiace Eh, sì, mentre eh, do la parola al scritto Avvocato Ciuccine, solo un commento rapidissimo da totale ignorante, la, la tutela dei dati personali sono un modo di gestire anche l'incertezza, quindi sono un modo per prevenire quella diffondersi di informazioni che potrebbero portare all'intolleranza, eccetera. Sì, eh, faccio la domanda in italiano, sì. così, grazie. Eh, mentre faceva la sua presentazione cercavo di recuperare le mie categorie concettuali appunto da giurista allora, mi ricordo libertà, uguaglianza e fraternità no? fin dalla rivoluzione francese in poi ecco la fraternità poi ho cercato di capire se la fraternità era la tolleranza più la pace però forse sì forse no cioè, la domanda è ma la fraternità non, non è più tanto importante oppure tutto il questa è una domanda brutalmente semplice e bellissima, cui non, non me la voglio cavare dicendo è complesso. E quindi azzardo in realtà un'ipotesi. Un la fraternità in realtà sarebbe forse la cosa, se non la più importante, altrettanto importante quanto gli altri valori, che, le altre variabili che vi ho messo lì in lista. La pace, la tolleranza, la giustizia, eccetera. Perché non, non compare lì in questa analisi? lo faccio semplice eh? adesso devo scattare tutte le pallette dell'aria allora non compare perché tutta questa analisi parte dal presupposto che si accetti come assioma di fondo due cose uno che è meglio lavorare sulla base di una cosiddetta antropologia negativa traduce in tutti gli uomini sono bastardi dove uomini è gender di eh? nel caso di donne, del sasso. Allora, eh, quindi antropologia negativa con la logica del meglio assicurarsi contro comunque rischio piuttosto che fondare la propria analisi sul fatto che la fratellanza o, o, o un'antropologia positiva possa fare la differenza. Se noi mettiamo insieme queste due cose, cioè l'idea che è meglio pensare al peggio perché al meglio ci pensa il meglio, più allora qual è il peggio? Il peggio è pensare che gli uomini, gli esseri umani, siano tutti lì pronti a, a, a sgozzarsi eh, ad ogni minuto, ha una visione un po' obesiana, eccetera. Allora qui si ricostruisce quello che va da Hobbes, attraverso Kant, fino a Hobbes, antropologia negativa. Come si gestisce l'antropologia negativa? Con due principi di fondo. Io quando lo spiego un po' in altri contesti, il grande aereo c'ha due motori. I due motori sono, da un lato, l'interesse selfish, personale, e la logica razionale. Allora, noi individuiamo il mondo come fatto di, assolutamente, di animali bastardi che vorrebbero ammazzarsi di uno gli altri. Li dobbiamo gestire. Gli diamo, in questo modellino, sufficiente razionalità e sufficiente interesse privato, personale, selfish e tutto il resto serve. La sua domanda, che mi sembra, anzi la tua domanda che diciamo tutta prima, mi sembra fondamentale perché, tolgo mi sembra, è fondamentale perché mette in discussione una cosa che io in un altro contesto farei molto volentieri, cioè tutto il pacchetto, 
il pacchetto complessivo è tutta questa roba che vi ho spiegato oggi, più antropologia negativa, razionalità, diciamo così, economica, domus economicus, per dirla in termini semplici, più interesse selfish. Se noi mettiamo quel pacchetto con queste tre cose da una parte e diciamo oh, guarda che c'è tutta un'altra storia che si potrebbe fare, una storia in cui in realtà, ad esempio, il sistema giuridico è, ha come fondamento la collaborazione, cioè le regole stanno lì perché così anche in una società fatta di angeli si riesce ad organizzare una sbrozza perché gli angeli da soli senza regole la sbrozza non la organizzano e sono tutti agenti buonissimi si vogliono tanto bene ma si devono organizzare chi compra la birra e chi ci metteva la birra allora in questa picture in questa prospettiva la domanda ma la fredina dove sta messa? sta messa nella, nella, nella visione alternativa di un'antropologia non negativa che però oggi non ce l'ha dentro è nucleare ecco. scusa per la risposta un po' lunga ma microfono dov'è? Allora, io non ho capito un punto dell'analisi la definizione che lei dà di ignoranza oh, grazie <ride> la definizione che lei dà di ignoranza è mancanza di domande e mancanza di risposte c'è cioè un'assenza come, come si può scelerare un'assenza? allora io ho fatto lì c'era quello schermino un po' a diagramma di Venn che nascondeva dietro però di gran lunga più noiosi Um, è altamente improbabile che preso un numero n qualsiasi di individui dove n, da due in su no? tutti questi individui abbiano esattamente le stesse mancanze cioè che ad esempio io e lei non soltanto abbiamo informazioni ma che abbiamo esattamente la stessa, lo stesso grado di ignoranza sarebbe straordinario io infatti nell'esempio eh, con Bob e Alice, lo potrei giustare in questo modo, Bob ha completa ignoranza rispetto a 1, 2, 3, 4 e Alice ha completa ignoranza rispetto a 5, 6, 7, 8. Quando si incontrano, che cos'è che condividono? All'improvviso quell'ignoranza di Alice e di Bob diventa messa insieme il fatto che ah, io non ci ho mai pensato a fare quella domanda, non è che ho la risposta, ma io non avevo mai pensato che si potesse no, porre in questione c'è o non c'è una spada magica ma lei c'è, lo so, non lo so non ho la risposta però adesso c'è una domanda ora la cosa straordinaria che è difficile da spiegare però adesso l'ho spiegata oggi perché dobbiamo mettere no, sul, sul tavolo della cucina molti, molti ingredienti ma la cosa difficile da spiegare normalmente è che l'ignoranza non è incertezza cioè l'ignoranza è quella cosa che poi so, in America andavo qualche tempo fa no? non ha non so e quando questo è stato detto, è stato detto con grande acume, poi tutti l'hanno preso in giro, poi detto, come si chiama, non so. ma, ma l'ha detto con grandissimo acume, ci sono unknown unknowns, nel senso di, ci sono domande che noi non sappiamo neppure che esistano, e come fai a saperlo? Infatti io lo so soltanto metateoricamente, io non, non, non so quelle, non le conosco quelle domande, ma una volta che ho sentito dire che c'è l'ignoranza, io, boh, io non so che cos'è, però ce l'ho dopo io. Allora, quando ci mettiamo insieme, la sua e la mia ignoranza genera incertezza, che è una cosa buona, politicamente parlando. Non so se sto spiegando un po', un po meglio. C'è una domanda? Prego. No, volevo semplicemente dire che, secondo me, il discorso dell'incertezza ha un'applicazione diretta ai discorsi che ci sono in questo periodo su NSA eccetera perché non sappiamo esattamente cosa fosse questa NSA cioè cosa facessero ancora esattamente però per come l'ho capita io i big data che collezionava l'NSA venivano analizzati al fine di cercare una causalità cioè non so una persona che scrive X pensa X fa X farà poi Y più o meno Invece il discorso dell'incertezza è proprio l'opposto, cioè è cercare di evitare questa cosa, per come l'ho capita io, cioè cercare di evitare che, va bene, sappiamo X, meglio non forse non saperlo nemmeno, però anche se sappiamo X, non è detto che poi dopo ci sia Y, no? no? Cioè, non, non è, anche perché, tra l'altro, non è nemmeno forse giustificata la causalità che loro cercavano di far rinvenire in questi dati, no? E secondo me... Allora, per, quello, eh, per come l'ho capito io, il discorso di incertezza si applica a tutti questi, 
questi panorami sui big data. Sì, eh, mi pare che sia, sì, siccome non ci ho pensato abbastanza sopra, non vorrei mh, esagerare nel, ah, nell'abbracciare la tesi, eh, però mi pare che sia, sì, rispetto a quello che eh, Juan Carlos diceva un momento fa, eh, ci sono anche questioni di privacy che lei appunto stesse menzionando, dove il concetto di, eh, di ignoranza sembra essere prezioso. Io, facendo un esempio casalingo, non vorrei che mia moglie fosse incerta sulla mia fedeltà, io vorrei che, ne, che fosse ignorante. Io vorrei che lei non, non conoscesse neanche la domanda sul fatto se facciamo il fedele oppure no. E questo secondo me fa una bella differenza. La differenza tra chi si è posto la domanda e non sa la risposta e chi non si è mai posto neanche la domanda. Ecco, ci sono casi in cui, come questo della fedeltà, in cui io vorrei che la domanda non fosse neanche stata presa in considerazione. Diciamo, qua non ci ho mai pensato, madonna santa. Ecco, questa è la questione che vorrei vedere, so, magari anche alcuni internet service provider. Oh, cioè, potevamo fare questa data analysis, non c'era neanche venuto in mente, guarda un po'. Ecco, uh, purtroppo non è così, perché l'informazione, come dicevamo prima, cresce costantemente, quindi basta che mia moglie parla con la collega, la collega ha avuto la domanda ed è la prima cosa che pensa che forse anche il cioè, poi si dà magari una risposta negativa, come vedete. Ma insomma, allora, eh, in Italia scusate, al di là della piccola analogia un po' per sollevare la, il tono della discussione, e, spero, <coughs> mi sa che sono le guai, eh, la, la questione del, del valore della, della incertezza, eh, purtroppo, ne, se noi prendiamo i, i testi classici della dell'analisi del rischio. Quando si parla del valore dell'incertezza, si parla del valore della conoscenza del grado di incertezza, non dell'incertezza. Diciamo, cioè, è come se uno dicesse, guarda, ci sono un sacco di buche, le buche fanno schifo, però sapere dove stanno le buche è una bellissima cosa. Quello che io vi sto dicendo qui è che sono le buche che sono anche importanti, cioè al di là di un discorso economico di conoscenza del grado di incertezza che noi abbiamo quando dobbiamo valutare alcune operazioni, a volte sono proprio le buche, è proprio quello che non c'è che vale la pena di valorizzare. Questo purtroppo, forse come diceva già un altro collega, significa raddrizzare un po' i parametri con i quali noi siamo abituati a ragionare, però noi siamo sostanzialmente eredi di cartesi, oggetto. Io fino all'altro ieri insegnavo corsi dove la certezza era l'ultima cosa fondamentale sulla quale si poteva basare tutta la scienza occidentale, l'ego co cogito del prosumo. Noi siamo cresciuti in questa cultura dove la certezza è fondamento della conoscenza che è fondamento della società, eccetera. Venissi a sentir dire che forse ci sono alcuni, alcuni angoli in cui non soltanto l'incertezza è un valore, ma può essere accresciuto attraverso l'ignoranza, va conto pieno, ecco. quindi capisco un po' la, la reazione di dove sta per la mano, insomma. Allora, darei un'ultima possibilità ai nostri ospiti, ai ragazzi dell'istituto, che sono, li vedo ondeggiare sotto l'impatto di queste ore. Qualcuno vuole fare una domanda? Non nascondetevi. Direi di no, allora a questo punto, anche per non ritardare i tempi e allungare troppo questo pomeriggio, ringraziare ancora il professor Floridi e ci vediamo ai 45. Grazie.